We'll call to order the special joint meeting of the Lakeshore Town Council and Utility Advisory Board on Wednesday, January the 8th. Um, welcome to our guests. Uh, we will begin by um, adoption of the agenda. Are there any edits to the agenda? Would someone like to move that we approve it? I'll, I'll move that we adopt the agenda. All right. I second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We will then begin and welcome to all of you. Um, we will have with the LaBella presentation and um, let us know if there's anything we can do while you're presenting. Otherwise, we wait with bated breath. Well, thank you, Mayor Pritchett. Um, first off, Mayor, Council Members, uh, Mr. Baldwin, uh, members of the UAB and, and the residents of Lake Lure, uh, we want to, uh, to say thank you for the opportunity uh, to, to be here today uh, to help, um, you know, uh, tell a little bit of our story and, and how uh, what the, the company that we represent and also some of the and the people that we have here. Um, my name is Keith Garbrick. Uh, I'm with LaBella. Uh, today I have uh, Maurice Walsh, who actually goes by Reese, and Brian Houston uh, as part of our team. Um, there's three things that we want to try to accomplish today, and hopefully we do a, a, a good job of doing that, um, in addition to answering the questions that you proposed to us um, uh, prior to this presentation. Uh, one, we want to, to, to convey what our company is and, and what our company philosophy is and how we approach uh, uh, projects, how we approach clients, how we, um, uh, and, and what we are as a company, what we're about. Uh, the second thing is I'll, I'll, hopefully you'll get a, a feel for the personalities of the folks up here, um, how we would fit into the team that's already established. That's a big component of, of any successful team is, is the personalities involved. Uh, and the third thing we want to, we hopefully will we'll leave you with information um, that you can use whether you choose to move forward with us or, or go in a different direction. Um, case studies of projects that are similar. Um, some experiences that we've had that you may want to implement going forward to address some of the challenges that you, that you see um, uh, that you need to address in Lake Lore. So, so really, those are the three main things along with you know, answering the questions that, that you um, presented to us. Uh, so I'd like to, um, to move forward first with uh, LaBella. What, who are we and what do we represent? So LaBella is powered by partnership. So this is our this is our philosophy. This is how we address uh, everything in our business. Um, our core, core values are employee leadership at all levels, uh, stewardship of resources, whether that be inside the company and external with our clients' resources, uh, honesty and integrity in everything that we do, and seeking growth and embracing change. So. Um, this is a uh, partnership that you'll see this theme throughout our presentation today. Um, and, and, and hopefully, you know, moving forward, uh, we can develop a partnership with Lake Lore, um, whether it be on this project or any other project in the future that um, we can have a long-standing relationship uh, going forward. So with that, I'd like to, um, to have some of our team come up. Um, first, I'd like to ask Reese to come up to talk a little bit about himself and the role that he would be playing in the project, and then Brian will come up, and then I'll, I'll kind of follow those two. So, Reese. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity uh, for uh, presenting with you this morning. Uh, my name is Maurice Walsh. I go by Reese. Um, I will be in the program management and project management role. So in the <clears throat> as a program manager, I will be uh, the point of contact for all the various uh, uh, sections of your request for qualification. So as you deal with your subaqueous sewer system, as you deal with your wastewater plant, transportation, parks and recs, um, I will oversee all of, uh, of the work in those areas, as well as specifically with your wastewater plant. Um, to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I went to the, the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina, and 22 years ago started with Pease Associates, who would eventually become LaBella. Um, I took a, a brief uh, hiatus uh, doing some contracting and real estate development. I worked as a forensics engineer uh, before coming back to uh, Pease, now LaBella. Um, I am uh, married 18 years. I have four children. 
Um, I love Disney, as you can see from my cup and my tie. Um, um, I grew up and love uh, engineering and construction. That's, that's what, what strives me. And I love dealing with people. Um, I love dealing with, with homeowners. I love dealing with property owners, with elected officials, uh, with managers and staff um, and contractors. Um, <clears throat> I will be the primary point of contact between you and uh, the rest of my staff and potential contractors uh, should you select us. Um, and turn it over to Brian. Good morning, I'm Brian Houston. Um, okay. uh, I'm Brian Houston and uh, I, I lead the civil group um, in the Carolinas. And uh, on this particular project, um, I, uh, enlisted as a program manager or a project manager. So uh, I would be, as Reese has called me, sort of the guy behind the curtain, um, getting a lot of the work done and managing the team to uh, produce the work. I've been uh, doing water wastewater engineering for about 27 years now. Uh, went to Virginia Tech um, and uh, have uh, been doing really all kinds of water wastewater stuff, everything from um, line work, pump stations, treatment plants. I'll talk about a treatment plant that we're constructing right now um, in a little bit, uh, as well as some stuff even on advisory, um, like business advisory uh, side as well. Okay. And that, as I mentioned before, my, my name is Keith Garbrick, so I'm, I'm listed as the principal in charge. Um, so what does that really mean? Um, I'm, my role here is to make sure that the resources are available uh, to the team that's doing the work uh, and also to react to anything that the, the town needs as well. So um, I, uh, I'm a North Carolina native, um, grew up in Charlotte, uh, went to school at NC State uh, for engineering and construction management um, and uh, been with uh, uh, Labella, Pease Labella since 2006. Um, I think it's also important to note that Labella is an employee owned company and all three of the members you have up here are owners of the company. Uh, I think that's important because um, you know the success of our firm is directly related to the su success of our clients, and and that is uh, 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 critical to how we have been successful, um, and hopefully we'll 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 show that. Um, I think uh, we want to talk a little bit about a full service approach. So. Um, one unique thing about Labella is that we have uh, what we call a full service firm. Um, and I'll go through a lot of those, those services because I think uh, for the scale and scope of some of the projects that you're talking about, um, we can pull in resources internally to help address those uh, without having to bring in consultants, without having to bring in um, you know, another team member. We already have those resources in place. Uh, we have five uh, Charlotte or North Carolina uh, locations. Charlotte is one of them. Uh, we have a Gastonia office, Winston-Salem, Greensboro, uh, and Davidson. Um, we have 147 professional engineers, 19 of those uh, North Carolina. Uh, again, our focus is on client partnerships, and we have a history in North Carolina uh, of 80 years of working with clients. Um, and, and some of the clients that we will, um, you know, Leave some leave behinds from from client letters um, span 50 years uh, with the same same client. So uh, hopefully that is uh, something that we can um, can say with Lake Lore and, and Labella going forward. <clears throat> so uh, just a quick couple slides on what we do is uh, that full service approach. Uh, we, we break it up into four four different areas: infrastructure, buildings, waste recycling, and environmental and energy. Specifically on the infrastructure side, we solve complex problems. I mean, that's, that's why we're here. Um, you know, Lake Lore has a, a not necessarily a unique issue, but a complex one. Um, you know, sewer and wastewater in a small town um, that needs to be re rehabilitated and, and, and upgraded. Um, we handle these types of issues for our clients, um, not only in, in North Carolina, but uh, throughout the U.S. So that, that involves transportation, civil, uh, underneath the civil umbrella, it's water, wastewater, stormwater, um, things that you would typically associate with civil engineering, construction engineering, planning and grant writing, and surveying. Uh, the building side, we have a full service architecture, interior design, um, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, 
Uh, structural engineering, uh, we do a lot of structural assessments. Um, site development, hazardous building materials, all that is in-house. Um, waste recycling and environmental, uh, a lot of environmental remediation and compliance, uh, air permitting, solid waste, um, pipeline recycling, things like this. Um, and then the final one is energy. Um, we do a lot of work for large power utilities, uh, electric and gas transmission, hydropower uh, as well. Um, obviously we know, you know, um, Chernobyl's, you know, currently working with you guys on your dam and, and Penstock. Um, we work with them quite a bit as well as, as a partner on projects. Um, uh, we have a renewable side with solar uh, and wind, and we also do program management and, and construction management. So the whole purpose of, of just telling you all about those things is that, you know, we, we are a, a, there's a lot more to Labella than just what you see up here. We have, a, we have resources at our disposal, um, and, and that, you know, there are experts that we can bring in at any time to handle any situation that may come up. So now after we've kind of gone through that, we want to get a little bit more into the, obviously the focus of this presentation, which is the understanding of the project at hand. Um, I'm going to ask Brian to come up, or Reese, I'm sorry to come up. Uh, Reese is going to talk about, you know, how, what we understand your issues to be now and some of the, some of the solutions that we could help uh, provide. Thank you, Keith. One of the, <clears throat> one of the first steps in what we call front end planning is, is understanding um, what, what the actual problem is, knowing who the stakeholders are, um, knowing what they need, knowing what their expectations are. Um, our philosophy is one that is asset driven. In other words, we want to be proactive and not reactive. Uh, so when we look at a project, we are looking 20 years, 30 years, 40 years in the future, what's the best solution for the town long term? Um, <clears throat> with, uh, so going into to Lake Lore specifically, we're gonna focus on your subaqueous sanitary sewer system and your wastewater plant. Um, <clears throat> your system was built in the 1920s. Um, it was, the, the sewer system was constructed, the land was filled in to, to or the, lake was filled in around it. Uh, you have approximately 12 miles of HD inch diameter cast iron piping. You have 65 perimeter manholes, uh, some of which are, are in the perimeter of the lake, some of which are on it, some of which are a little bit outside it. You have one pump station and you have one wastewater plant that's just below a million gallons, a 0.995 um, MGD wastewater plant. Um, <clears throat> your challenges. Um, you might think that the, the primary challenge with your sewer system is this underwater. And that, that's, that's the reason for your challenge, but that's not your primary problem. Your primary problem is you can't access it. You can't get in there and see what condition it's in and estimate its remaining service life. Um, you have inflow and infiltration that's internal to your system from the lake and also external from Chimney Rock and um, from outside resorts. Uh, you have an unsustainable wastewater treatment plant process right now a plant that's supposed to be a biological plant is treating chemically. <coughs> um, you have sludge removal. Um, I noticed in the minutes that, that Shannon provided um, that you're using geotubes and having some issues with it um, and, and needing some assistance in sludge removal. Um, you have dam and hydroelectric rehabilitation. Um, one of our partners um, did a, a pavement condition study for you and so you have annual uh, street paving investment. Um, <coughs> you have annual dredging um, activities that have to go on to maintain use of the lake. Um, you have geological, topographical, financial challenges, and then you throw on top of that a special order of consent as it relates to your, to your wastewater plant. Um, <coughs> so a, a brief history in looking at what we understand about what, what's going on in your system. Um, in 2009, you undertook a joint wrapping program that did approximately 25 to 30% of accessible joints and reduced the flow going to the wastewater plant from a little over 900,000 gallons a day to around 600,000 gallons a day. The current flow rate where the lake level is now um, is about 230,000 gallons a day, um, which is an important indicator of where that INI is in your system. 
So our goals, what are we trying to achieve? A sustainable wastewater treatment process. We wanna get the wastewater plant back to a biological operation, treating the flow as it needs to. A replacement or rehabilitation of your subaqueous system. Uh, renewed regulatory relationships and compliance. Um, and then, as importantly, a financially viable solution. I mean, obviously, um, there's a perception you can do anything with money, uh, but money is a finite resource. <clears throat> so a couple of case studies. One of, one of the steps when you're conceptualizing a project is that you look around and see what are some other issues that municipalities have had where they have dealt with similar situations that we might can learn from and be applicable to ours. Um, I've identified two for you this morning. Uh, the first one is Lake uh, Oswego, uh, which is in Oregon. Uh, this is a situation where you had a, a, um, a population of 37,000 people. Um, they had uh, multiple issues. Um, one, they didn't know the condition of the system that was underneath the lake. Um, two, the system underneath the lake was not large enough, so they had a capacity issue. And then three, the Corps of Engineers had stipulated certain things they could do to the lake bottom and things that they could not do. So they, they had some, some additional issues. Um, it was only about 13,000 linear feet of line, so this was smaller than your system. Uh, the initial estimate for a low pressure system was around $120 million. Um, and they were faced with a lot of the same thing. You look at that price tag and you go, this is not financially viable. So what's an alternative? The alternative was a combination of pile supported and buoyancy tethered pipe. Uh, the reason they chose two approaches is because the Corps of Engineers would not allow them to attach the tethers in certain portions of the lake. And so those had to be redriven on piles. Um, the tethers, uh, they used HDPE to create a buoyancy and then they would drive uh, ground anchors sometimes hundreds of feet into bedrock and grout them to create a slope in the pipe. So the pipe is literally suspended about 14 feet uh, below the surface of the lake um, and is designed according to the, 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 from what I've seen with wall thicknesses that are sufficient to deal with, with water flows, with anchors hitting them, et cetera. It's deep enough that I don't think a boat would hit it. Um, the final cost of the system was $90 million. Um, so they saved about $25 million over a low pressure system. Um, a lot of that cost came into the, the deep foundation requirements. There are 425 uh, ground anchors that, that go hundreds of feet into bedrock. Um, and that, that really um, accelerated the price and that's why you don't see a, a significant uh, cost reduction. <clears throat> um, the second is Lake St. Louis. Uh, similar situations, subaqueous sanitary sewer system, um, in this case, they had capacity. The problem was they didn't know the condition. They didn't know the remaining surface life. Population of 16,000, they had about, um, had about eight miles of subaqueous sewer. Um, the, deepest man, or the, the deepest point of the line um, that they worked on in this lake was 55 feet. So it is shallower than the lake you're dealing with. Um, initial estimate, um, was 40 to 72 million, which is what, you know, around the price tag that, that, that you've been exposed to in, in various reports that you've seen. Um, they had a unique solution. Um, and this was to install accessible submerged manholes. Accessible submerged manholes. Um, and here's what that is. It's a double, it's a double structure. So it's a, a, um, a cast in place uh, concrete structure with an HDPE manhole inside of it. So the, the concrete provides the, the first level of containment and resists the water pressure. And then the HDPE inside is a second level of containment. And so they actually went out, one of the more difficult, uh, and, and speaking with the marine contractor that performed the project, one of the most difficult things that they had to do was find the line because it was buried under sediment. Um, when they located the line, the divers were able to go down, <coughs> construct manholes on the line, and then if you see the yellow um, in the photo here, those are aluminum shafts that go all the way down to the manholes. They seal them, they pump the water out, and now they have access to the line. They do closed circuit television, they do fold in form or cast in place pipe replacement to rehabilitate the line. So this was a project that actually gave them access 
and continued using the subaqueous system. And their plan is to go in and do uh, uh, closed circuit television of the line every 10 years and do repairs as need be. Um, they wind up putting 18 manholes in. Um, the total cost was a little under $25 million. Um, and like I say, I have talked with the Marine contractor that did this. Um, and regardless of the decision you come with today, he is more than willing to come down here and meet with you He's out of Pennsylvania and walk you through the process of, of how this was done. Uh, the more I dug into this, the more I realized that this was not unusual. Um, specifically in Pittsburgh, um, they have areas where uh, sewer laterals are actually under the river and they have these style manholes uh, to access those. So it's, it's not, um, you know, the initial thought when you hear about a subaqueous system is that it, it's absolutely unique. Um, but the truth is there are other municipalities who have dealt with similar issues. And in this beginning conceptual stage, you can interact with your counterparts there and you can learn very important lessons and things um, that can benefit you um, as we move forward. <clears throat> and I'll turn it over to Brian. Hi, Greece. So we have three of us here um, today from the civil group. Um, and, uh, you know, we represent three experts in a, a fairly large contingent of an 875 person firm. Um, but we could just as easily, if we were focusing on some of the other projects that are in your project tracker, we could bring some other people here. We have um, similar numbers of experts and very uh, significant capabilities in most of the areas you have covered um, on that project tracker. So I wanted to make that point. Um, specifically on the water wastewater experience, we'll talk about a few projects here. And the first one is uh, the wastewater treatment plant um, that uh, is under construction right now. This is Roxboro, North Carolina. It's a project that I designed. Um, and uh, it's a five million gallon per day uh, wastewater treatment plant. They were driven by an uh, MPDS, a DEQ uh, permit requirement to do something about their plant. Um, their plant was about 50, I guess maybe we're at about 55 years old now. Um, and uh, so it was kind of due for it, uh, but the, the permit limits and specifically the nutrient limits were what was driving um, them to have to do something pretty soon. Um, so anyway, this, uh, this project um, really touches almost every part of their plant. So we are replacing the biological process, and that's the picture in the bottom center there, that's the oxidation ditch that we're putting in. Um, but we're also, if you see just above that, you can see a, a building that is a brand new lab facility, uh, about a 5,000 square foot lab and office building. Um, you see the mechanical systems there, we're touching all of their uh, pumping systems in the plant. Um, though that's a complete redo of that particular pump station. Um, and uh, I guess those other pictures are some from the oxidation ditch. But we're, and then we're, the other thing that's pretty significant about this one is they have a, a pretty severe eye and eye problem. It's a five million gallon per day plant. They have a 20 million gallon per day capacity on their meter and they peg the meter sometimes. Mm. So uh, we have, uh, we're taking the existing uh, facility, which is, you can see the green rectangle up there. That's one of the two basins they don't use and uh, we're turning those into equalization. So they'll have about six million gallons of equalization and a five uh, million gallon per day plant. Um, what I really loved about working on this project um, is that everything was in house. Now, uh, some of the field services we do, sub out survey, geotech, um, but as far as the design services, we have everything in house. It's not just in house, it's, it's in our office space. It's in Charlotte. And so we had the architectural, the architectural was done in our office. The, all the mechanical building systems for that building were done in our office. Uh, so we have the mechanical engineering, structural engineering, electrical engineering. Um, we even did the regulated building materials inspections um, from our office. So we've got just a ton of different resources. They're very accessible. It makes managing a project that's a multidiscipline complex project like this really a pleasure to do. Um, and uh, you know, having those capabilities is um, something that sets us apart. Keith's going to talk about uh, another project, too. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> so uh, again, I want to reiterate the reason we're bringing some of these projects up or, or 
one, there's, there's bits of pieces of all these projects that can be applicable to, to the challenges that you guys face. Uh, but also, um, you know, we, wanna, we want you to get a feel for, for the company and, and what we do and how we're a little bit different than anybody else. And so, you know, to Brian's point, being able to have all those resources in-house and have that design happen in one location, uh, local, uh, is, is a big asset. Um, so the next project is, is called North Hamby Creek, and, and North Hamby Creek is in Thomasville, North Carolina. Um, the reason we wanted to talk about this project with, with you all was um, Thomasville was under a, uh, an SOC as well. Uh, they, they were in the news, they were on TV for uh, spills in High Rock Lake, uh, fish kills, they were, River Keeper was all over them. This was a very um, uh, highly publicized and, and media was had grabbed a hold of this and, and kind of painted Thomasville in a bad light. Um, so the state got involved um, and we had, um, as, as a trusted partner of Thomasville, had helped them negotiate with DEQ, with the state, you know, the terms of that um, consent and, and how they were going to be able to approach it, how they were going to be able to phase the project in a way that allowed them to financially take it on. Um, and also meet, you know, the, the state's requirements. Um, so this is, uh, we call this outfall one and two. This is actually probably phase two and three of an overall project. So we upgraded some pump stations and then we had to replace, um, replace outfalls uh, because of some I and I. And so that was really what their, their main issue was. Um, in working with the state, uh, we've met all of their their, uh, their deadlines ahead of schedule, uh, met their timeline, uh, and since we've started working on the project and upgrading it, uh, they haven't had another spill, uh, which is key in developing that relationship with the state uh, and also with the, the media and the perception of what the, the, the town is doing, what the city of Thomasville is doing. Um, and so it, it, that, I think that has some, some validity to what's happening in, in Lake Lures. You know, there's a working with the state, getting them on board with the plan, uh, but also managing the perception of what's going on and how we address that. Um, and again, this is a, a client that um, you know, we've been working with for uh, 30 plus years. And so <clears throat> that was the reason we wanted to, to highlight this. And the next project we're gonna bring up, um, Reese is gonna talk about, which uh, you may be familiar with as well. Thank you. The, the next um, project I'm going to talk about is the Spindale Wastewater Treatment Plant um, Rehabilitation. Um, so a little bit of history. Um, we have a, a former employee turned uh, self-employed. Uh, his name is Kurt Wright. You're familiar with him with SDG. He's a longtime corporate partner of ours that, that we use him and he uses us. And he was working with the town of Spindale. Um, as a result of 11 NOVs and uh, a notice from the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, <coughs> and he brought us in uh, because we provide, we have the, the capacity for the civil design, the structural um, services. And I was the project manager. I was the day, um, I was there four days a week. Um, this project was complex enough um, that I was literally on site almost every day. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to highlight this this project for a couple reasons. Um, one, um, it's a it's a small municipality. Um, due to loss of industry, um, their budget was severely depressed. Um, they had enormous problems. Um, their plant was on the verge of total failure. Um, they had no redundancy. They had one headworks. Um, they had one aeration basin that was nearly full of solids. It accumulated over 20 years. They had one operational clarifier. They had one operational core in contact. It's landlocked because it was built into a floodplain in the 60s on alluvial soils. So it had terrible geotechnical issues. Um, it had high groundwater. It had underground springs. Um, <coughs> and it, essentially any issue you could think that could go wrong at a wastewater plant had gone wrong here. And there was not enough money <coughs> to fix everything that needed to be fixed. And so we instituted very strict um, uh, financial controls where we were looking at not only we knew every dollar where it had been spent, 
and we were projecting the dollars that we were going to spend. I was sitting talking with a commissioner uh, following the adoption of a capital project budget ordinance and he shook my hand and he said, understand we can't spend any more money. That's it. Um, and so <clears throat> we worked with the contractor, we value engineered the project, we looked for innovative ways to do things. Uh, we actually, if you're looking at the picture here, um, we actually built new concrete structures in that basin while the basin was treating wastewater. Um, we did it by driving a coffer dam, putting in temporary uh, infrastructure to, to direct flow and process flow around it. Um, the end result, and, and I'll go into this a little bit later, a plant that had 11 NOVs and an EPA just calls notice was awarded a, a, a letter of commendation from the, the Asheville office, the Division of Water Resources, because for three years we had no NOVs, despite the fact that we did major process upheavals. Um, the plant today is a state-of-the-art plant. Um, <clears throat> it has two process trains. It now has redundancy. It has three operational clarifiers. Um, and it has one uh, about a three and a half million gallon EQ basin. Um, but again, it, it's highlighting working with your stakeholders. Um, Kurt and I made several trips to Raleigh to meet with Division of Water Infrastructure to walk through what we were trying to do. Um, Tim Heim and, and Mikkel Wilbur were invited to every single monthly project meeting. They were involved when, when we were gonna do something, we would call Tim say, Tim, we're gonna do something, and, and when you see the DMRs for this, the flow might be zero. Um, so when he saw our DMRs, he knew. Uh, he knew ahead of time what we were doing, what our plan was, um, and that it's, it's critical when managing expectations is, is critical to a successful project. And bringing in the stakeholders, understanding their expectations, telling them what they can expect, and then doing what you told them. Um, it, it is critical to a successful project and to rebuilding uh, the image with the public and the image with the state. <clears throat> so we understand, of course, that uh, funding for this um, very large group of projects is definitely a concern and we wanted to um, give you some information about some of the things that we've done on funding. Uh, one of uh, be clear as we start looking at this slide. I got a big number there, and there's a different number in the proposal. The proposal, I think we put 88 million, and we realized that that uh, 88 million really was just Reese and Heather Miller in our office. Um, so we want to give you all a bigger picture. So that 575 is a, a total number um, that is corporate. Uh, so that's the amount of uh, funding that we've gotten our clients corporate wide. But 110 million of that is Charlotte. And that's uh, work that we've done. Most of that, I think, a uh, little over 80, about 82, I think, of that is money that has that we've secured for our clients in the past uh, five to six years. Uh, most of that, I will give credit to Heather Miller for, and she works in the office with me. Um, she knows the the agency. She knows the people. Um, she is the go-to person in our office uh, for anything that is um, grant related or funding related. She monitors the SRF, she knows what all the dates and everything are for that. Um, and she, she uh, deals with that quite a bit. Um, the 21.8 up there, the USDA, um, and I'll, I'll uh, just point to it again, but that's money that we recently got that's funding the um, Roxboro uh, wastewater treatment plant project. Um, what's important about this is just understanding that um, each of these agencies has their own way of doing things and we discover very quickly when we get into uh, any kind of after the fact funding that if you have written a report and then they decide to go fund it by some other method that you didn't know about before you're going to be rewriting the report. You can't send, you know, they, they have their very prescriptive requirements of what they want to see. Um, and in the end, a lot of what you have to do with them um, is to just check those boxes for them and, and demonstrate to them that you're addressing every issue they have concern over. Um, one of the things that Heather is particularly adept at is uh, with the SRF funds, getting those points. I mean, it's all about this point system and they have a certain amount of money and they, they rank them by points and then they draw a line where they run out of money and if you're above that line, you get it. If you're below the line, you don't. And um, so she's become very adept at looking for ways to eke out those points to try to push you up, uh, uh, up to the top of that line. 
Okay. So one of the things we do on a probably a daily basis um, is is we try to put ourselves in your position. Right? We try to understand, you know, sitting sitting in the chair, being in your shoes, understanding, you know. Uh, what your expectations are and, 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 and trying to meet those. You know, as we were talking about this presentation and as we were looking at, um, you know, things that, that might make sense, um, you know, from if I was sitting, uh, you know, across the table, I'd, I'd say, you know, I have, I have two engineering firms here who obviously have substantial resources available to them. Uh, and, and obviously we understand that there's a, you know, a relationship with Withers and Ravenel and the funding side and working with your planning, financial planning and things like that. And I think what we've demonstrated in the previous slide is we are obviously more than capable of, of securing funding for our clients. Um, but we wanted to, to, to bring this up that, you know, it may make sense to partner two firms together. Uh, if they bring adequate resources or have a, a relationship that's already establish, uh, why change that? Uh, if they can go get the funding and get the money and that, that's already an integral part of this process, uh, use that. Um, you know, we, we feel we have a, a strong uh, engineering side and, and can solve the complex technical side of this. Um, you know, so that may be an option. We're always trying to think of, you know, unique ways to, to solve problems and this may be one that you consider. Um, and if that doesn't make sense as well, if you want one one firm, obviously we feel we could we could handle all that. But um, you know, it's just part of the the you know thinking of, of of how to address the problems that you're facing. So, anyways, that that was something we wanted to at least propose, and, and you know, we'd be open to that. Um, you know, we obviously respect Withers you know greatly. I mean, they they're a partner in in a lot of other projects as well. So, um, just something to to consider. <coughs> So the, the next part we wanted to talk about was state agency relationships. So uh, obviously this is going to be critical to any success that, that you have uh, with, with working with them. And so what we wanted to do was to try to highlight some, some projects where we've had some really strong uh, relationships with the state. Um, this is a water treatment plant, so the project itself from a technical side doesn't really relate to what you're doing. but. Um, uh, from the perspective of, of the state, this was a huge milestone. Um, this is a, a total project cost, which was a phased approach of $65 million. Uh, it's, a, it's a water treatment facility. The thing to highlight is that this is a membrane technology. So this is the reason this is important. Um, this was the first of, a kind, first of its kind in North Carolina. So the state had not permitted this type of technology uh, and, uh, uh, until this, this project. Um, and so what we did in working with the client and the state, um, we had multiple meetings. We actually had multiple site visits with the state uh, DEQ folks uh, out of state to look at technologies. Uh, but what this project did, this actually rewrote the rules and regulations at the state level to allow this to be a technology utilized um, for municipalities. Since this project has been uh, commissioned, uh, multiple municipalities have utilized this technology. The benefit is it's a higher quality water at a lower cost uh, to the ratepayer, um, and and essentially takes uh, the state and and uh, DEQ regulations to the next level. So uh, those are things that uh, they don't necessarily do lightly. Obviously, they're they're protecting the public public interest. So that um, those decisions are usually made very methodically and, and are, are a bit more long term, but uh, they had a trusted partner in, in us and also with the client and their staff and, and the knowledge that they had in order to implement this. So uh, something to, to, uh, to note um, that you know, we do have uh, strong relationships with, with those folks. Um, in the next project we have, um, Reese is gonna come up and, and talk about. So the next project I want to highlight is the South Fork Sewer Phase 2. Um, this was a project that was decommissioning um, a public uh, wastewater treatment plant and a private wastewater treatment plant, putting in a pump station, putting in force main. Um, and the reason I want to, to highlight this is because if you went and you asked somebody, you have an engineering project, what could make this project complicated? 
And, and they might say the, the field conditions, the soil conditions, the rock, um, uh, the amount of land that you have. Um, most people would not think back and say the project history might make this a complicated situation. This particular project was conceptualized over 10 years um, before it was implemented. It went through multiple mayors, multiple city managers, multiple departments, um, multiple funding agencies. Um, the project was, was delayed and delayed and funding agencies were asked, hey, will you still hold the money but, but, but we can't start the project now? Um, the design was started by an engineering firm that went out of business. Um, the owner uh, attempted to, to get what they could from the engineering firm. They got basically a survey and sketches. Um, they tried to in-house um, turn this into a package that was, was biddable, um, but they didn't have the, the resources, so they, they turned to us. Um, and uh, fortunately, we do have the resources. Fortunately, I have a, 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 an upper level manager who, when I was presented with this problem and he said, what do you need? And I said, everyone. Um, he said, here you go. Um, in three days, um, we took what we were given, a survey and sketches, and we turned it into a bid package and get it out the door to meet the project deadline. Um, <clears throat> this project wound up with five different funding agencies. Um, each of those agencies had their own particular way of doing things. Um, when the project was bid, um, the, the responsible low bidder was well over the available project budget. So right off the go, um, after everything that had taken place, there wasn't enough money to do the project. Um, where some people saw a roadblock, we saw an opportunity. And using the North Carolina bid statutes, we entered into negotiations with the responsible low bidder in what is essentially was a redesign. And he and I sat down and went through the entire project start to finish, looking for innovative ways to do things, looking for changes in uh, construction type, changes in material, risk allocation. Uh, we reduced over $1.2 million from the project without a change in scope. Um, that still wasn't enough. And Heather, who we've mentioned, who is also a, a project manager on the org chart um, in, your, in your water and in your funding, um, she was working simultaneously to get additional funding. Um, at the end of the day, with the cost we removed from the project, with the additional funding that she was able to achieve, we had the money and the project commenced and today um, is successful. Um, during the course of it, it was originally conceived that, that three wastewater treatment plants would be decommissioned. One of those municipal partners backed out, uh, another further complication. So th this highlights um, our ability um, where we walk into a situation that's not only difficult from an engineering standpoint, this took place in McCaddenville, um, which if you know the area is Christmastown, USA. And we were competing with North Carolina Department of Transportation who was, who was replacing a bridge and we're all racing for December because we were absolutely told we could not inhibit traffic at Christmas time. Um, and so working with the DOT, working with these funding agencies, working with the state um, to, to schedule and to accomplish this project um, was, was quite a task, uh, but in the end was successful. Um, the principles and the approach and our philosophy um, that, that we've utilized successfully on projects like this would be the exact same philosophy that we would bring to any situation here at Lake Thor. Um, I wanna highlight the Spindle Wastewater Treatment Plant again. Um, Principally because um, this was a plan, as I mentioned earlier, had 11 NOVs, was on the verge of failure, uh, was under uh, a notice from the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, when we brought in, this was um, a plant that was under the microscope. Um, Tim Heim and Mikkel Wilmer were frequently here. Uh, Ken Pollock and Bill Bland would frequently come down from Raleigh to see what was going on. Um, this was a project that, that put those principles and that, the, the asset management ideas to the test. Um, the first thing was identifying the stakeholders. And we met with the state, we met with the city staff, we met with the commissioners. Um, we, we laid out a roadmap, 
Um, we, we integrated the Division of Water Infrastructure, the funding agency's uh, input. Uh, we kept uh, Tim uh, Heim in, in Asheville apprised of what was going on. We integrated his input. Um, the ORC at the plant um, had the standing authorization to walk out onto the construction site and bring everything to a halt if something we were doing were affecting his NPDES permit. Um, so we, we had rules in place um, and we worked through this. Three years is what it took. Um, but at the end of three years, when we had the ribbon cutting, uh, the secretary of DEQ came to our ribbon cutting at a wastewater plant. Um, we received a letter of commendation from the Asheville office. Um, you currently have worked with Anita Robertson, I think, uh, Kim Colson, um, and, and Ken Pollock. Um, if you move further with them, you can add to it uh, Pam Whitmore, Mark Hubbard, Keith Koswicki, um, of course you know Tim Heim and Michaela Wilmer. Um, the individuals that you're trying to build your relationship with are individuals we spent the last three years changing the relationship with Spendo with. And we will use that goodwill and those same techniques to change the state's outlook um, on Lake Floor, um, given the chance. Uh, the next project is uh, Roxburgh. Keep coming back to Roxburgh. It might make y'all think this is the only thing I've done for the past <laughs> five years. I have done other things. Um, the, the point I really want to make about Roxborough with regards to the regulatory uh, issues um, is, is in the end of this project, I was really surprised. I've never um, submitted a uh, project this complex to a review agency and gotten as quick of uh, and as easy of a response as we did get on it. But it, it didn't come for free. There were things that that we did um, in dealing directly with DEQ as we were working on this project to make sure that when we submitted the final plans form, they knew exactly what was coming and they were ready for it and they were ready to approve it. So we had, uh, we had meetings with them, um, three different meetings, uh, formal meetings during the progress of the project um, and I kept the uh, DEQ contacts name on speed dial and had several conversations as we were going through the design just to make sure that he knew what we were doing. Um, so we met with him at the very beginning, walked through the concept. This is what we're thinking about doing. Um, are there any things that you see that we need to consider? Are there concerns you have we need to address? Uh, that really gets them on board right off the bat because they feel like they're part of, of what you're doing. Um, we went at uh, the 60 percent, we had a basis of design report that laid out how we were addressing particular issues through the plant and we had a 60% set of plans. We went, took those plans, sat with them. I mean, the, the guy at DEQ is like, we don't normally do this, but we'll do it. So they're willing to do it, but it's, it was a little unusual. We flipped through the plans, we walked through everything, get more feedback from them. Um, as I said, had them on speed dial, it was calling uh, with questions along the way, and that helped keep us um, out of some trouble too on some things. Uh, we got to the end um, with the complete design. I hand delivered it. We sat in the office. We walked through the plans. We talked about everything that, that we had addressed that they'd asked questions about before. Um, and we turned it in with the application for the authorization to construct. And about 45 days later, we got the ATC with no comments whatsoever. So um, just a real success in dealing with um, DEQ. But again, those things. I say they don't come for free, they take effort. And, and you have to put that effort in. It's really easy um, to design something and then when you're completely done, surprise the regulator with it. Um, that's probably gonna cause you some problems in, in getting to the approval point. Um, okay, so uh, one of the questions that y'all posed to us was uh, about project management um, <coughs> efforts that we can do, uh, practices that we can do to um, improve the construction process. And um, so I've got several things here that we do. These are just standard practices for us. We have five uh, full-time um, construction observers, we call them, or, or inspectors um, that are on staff with us. Uh, one of them is at my uh, Roxborough Wastewater Treatment Plant, monitoring that five days a week. Um, and uh, we generally recommend to have on anything that's got any significant complexity to it, to have that full-time eyes on the ground 
uh, monitoring of the work. It, it really is valuable. It keeps you from um, having arguments about, as soon as you tell a contractor he's got to pull something out because you didn't see it when it was going in, um, that'll create an argument and you get to avoid that if you catch it beforehand. Um, we have an uh, uh, online document management system called Informa that really, really streamlines communication. It's not unusual for us to get an RFI through Informa in the morning and by noon, one o'clock, it's, it's answered. Um, and it's just, they, the contractor gets online, fills that out, we get notification, we take a look at it, address it, um, post it back to New Forma, they get it back. Um, I'm using that right now on two projects uh, myself. Um, I do do something other than Roxboro. Um, and uh, and uh, we use it company-wide on lots of different projects. Um, I, I mentioned that RFI, issue. Time is of the essence and we know that. When a contractor's out, um, when they're sitting on a backhoe, we've got to be very responsive. So we do push. When we see those um, notifications with questions or the phone rings, we jump on it. Um, one of the things we do in New Formo, we can set deadlines uh, for submittals. We have a standard two-week turnaround for submittals, which is pretty common. We set the deadline in New Formo for a week to make sure that we're getting pushed if we haven't done it quicker than expected. Um, but in the end, when it comes to construction, nothing beats good working relationships with the contractor. So you really want to do things that, um, that set the contractor up for a successful project too. If you put their back against the wall from the beginning, um, then that can make, make it very hard to get through uh, the project successfully. And a lot of that comes really during the design phase. Um, so uh, there are things that contractors run into that cause them problems like conflicts where you maybe have a mechanical design and electrical design and things are going through each other. Well, that doesn't work in real life. Uh, one of the things that I love about the way we design any kind of facility project is we use Revit. Well, Revit is basically building a three-dimensional model of the facility and all of the disciplines, electrical, structural, mechanical, civil, we're all working um, inside the same model. So we're essentially building the project in three dimensions on a computer. Any kind of conflicts that come up, we find them as we're putting it together and we're able to resolve those things before a contractor has to deal with them. Um, our, uh, our quality control, and we're, we're in the beginning processes of implementing um, what I've called the Excellence Assurance Plan or the EAP. And uh, I refer to it that way because I don't like the kind of stale QAQC uh, terminology because I think that gets lost on people. Um, and uh, it, too often what that ends up being is a rubber stamp at the end of a project when it's really too late to change a lot of things anyway. Um, the EAP and uh, for instance, Reese is my quality technical reviewer on a, a project that I'm doing right now that's a sewer modeling analysis project. Um, so the, the EAP starts out at the very beginning of a project. Um, at the beginning of that job I went to Reese, I said what kind of involvement do you need in this to make sure that, that you have adequate time to put the review in it. Um, and so it, it starts at that stage and then that person is involved throughout the project, um, overseeing things, giving advice, interim milestones, so and so <coughs> forth. And at the end, what you'll see on our deliverables is a stamp that says, we've done this. We've adhered to the plan. We've done what we said we're gonna do from a quality standpoint. Um, another thing we can do, and this is, I'll mention a project I'm doing in Gastonia. We've got about $35 million worth of sewer infrastructure that's getting ready to go to construction in Gastonia. We've already put two little pieces of it out to bid. And we've really engaged the contractors to ask them, what are the things that will make it um, simpler and more cost effective for you to get this work done. Um, and a couple of things that we're doing on that Gastonia job to accommodate that is we're giving them a lot of schedule flexibility. Um, that has more impact on cost than you might think. When you give them that schedule flexibility, they have the ability to fit it in their project and they're not thinking about, or fit it in their schedule of other work and they're not worried about cramming and maybe even ending up in liquidated damages because they couldn't start right away. Um, so that, that has been a real big thing for them. And then looking at how we break the packages down to manageable sizes so that we get a lot of bitter response and of course that drives price down. 
So um, really engaging contractors um, to figure out how to put it out there can have a real big impact on that success. Um, and then of course, uh, construction quality control requirements in our full-time inspectors on jobs are making sure those, um, those special inspections are happening. Typically, we would recommend that the owner um, pay for those special inspections or have us um, pay for those special inspections rather than having some uh, people might um, want the contractor be in control of that. And we think that's kind of the fox watching the hen house. So we have um, just a real quick, uh, this is a couple minute video here that we'd like to leave you with. Um, and uh, the point of this, I think we've been talking about that partnership um, drive of LaBella and how that really is who we are. Um, and I think this will really drive that home for you. So hopefully my speaker is going to work. Our clients can look to us as a trusted advisor Listen and see things from their side of the table. Their success is our success. We are stewards of the companies with the clients and sources. LaBella Associates is a firm that we put our trust in. They're committed to high quality. They listen to what the client needs. It's a great partnership. By hungering with the client, we are able to deliver service and product that goes beyond the what they expected. We want a partnership. LaBella really understanding what our objectives were our culture and translating into the design. The building's done magnificently. We want to be invested in the communities in which we work. We want to give back. We want to be connected to them. We're about collaboration. We're about relationships. We have been working with Mobile Associates for 37 years. They can provide us with the answers we're looking for. They let us know that we call them anytime, ask them any questions. Joining a larger firm like the Bell and all the consultants in house have been great. If we need help, their office will jump in and team with us. Everybody here, they feel like and act like they are owners. They're very proud of the company. LaBella is a world-class firm with a great team of people, very experienced and talented practitioners in their fields. Working with them has really been a true partnership. We started looking at how we applied our brand and logo. When we talked to our clients, the word partnership is the word that they kept using. It's really a testament to the quality of people we have, the energy they bring. We have the same values and the same culture that we had when we had people, and now we have 650 people. Lamella is celebrating 40 years. Our people are the engine that drive Lamella. They are the most valuable resource. It's the people that power Lamella, powered by partnership. Powered by partnership. Powered by partnership. Powered by partnership. At Lamella, we are powered by partnership. So that concludes our, our presentation for you today. Um, again, we, we're very grateful just to have the opportunity to, to be here, um, to, to hopefully leave you with some ideas. Um, you get a better sense of who we are as individuals, but also as a company. Um, and I, and um, we have some leave behinds uh, as well, uh, some letters from our clients that we think you may be interested in and in, in reading. Um, and then I understand question and answers uh, period. Yes, if the UAB would like to move forward to these tables now, it might be a little bit uh, easier for you to be involved in the question and answer. Thank you so much for your presentation. Do they need your microphone? Probably. Um, do you think that you all will need your microphone? Okay. <coughs> <coughs> Laura's going to get it for you. So we'll open up now to questions from both commissioners and the UAB. I think we get four questions.
question. <laughs> sewer collection and wastewater treatment uh, plant solutions which uh, you had gotten into uh, particularly Rock Pearl and, and the spoon mill. but it's relative to the subaqueous collection system and physical chemical plant. Please describe your capabilities and experience and explain your approach for resolving our unique problems. And, and again, I think you've done a good, good job with your presentation in, in, in doing, answering some of this question. I can speak uh, more to that if you okay. need to. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I, I view um, I, I view the subaqueous sewer system and the wastewater treatment plan as uh, as two issues. They're related, obviously. Um, specifically with your your wastewater treatment plan, um, looking at um, different options looking at different processes um, and, and doing a, a true alternates analysis of what's out there for you. Um, but the wastewater plant has to be designed to complement the initial or, or, or the final goal for the subaqueous sewer system. And so those two, those two have to be linked. Um, for example, I know that uh, about an hour west of here, another client of ours, Carolina Water Service, uh, built an SBR at, at Canesti Falls. And I know that, that several of you have been there, is my understanding. Um, um, I know that there have been discussions with, uh, with David Arrowwood about different approaches to, to putting in a, a low-grade HDPE liner around the perimeter of the lake, uh, manhole rehabilitation. Um, I mean, one of the things I alluded to earlier was looking at what happened to your I and I as you did the pipe wrap, and you went from 900,000 gallons to 600,000 gallons, and then as you lowered the lake level, you went from 600,000 gallons to 230,000 gallons. Well, looking at going back in in your history and looking at what your flows are when the lake is down, looking at the flow characteristics, the BOD, the ammonia, the TSS, um, that information is critical in going through the state and saying, okay, here's our plan. Um, we're gonna first, we're gonna get rid of our INI, and we're gonna get our plant back to a biological process. We're gonna meet the terms of the SOC. That's phase one. Maybe that's phase two, maybe that's phase three. Then we're gonna look at the rehabilitation and replacement of the subaqueous sewer system. Um, the, the solution with um, Aswega, Lake Aswega, the solution with the Lake St. <laughs> Louis. Uh, the solution is proposed with uh, a, a low-grade HTPE using lake water to flush it or intermediate pump stations to, to, to flush it. Um, these are all things that go into what we call front-end planning. And that's where you, you sit down, you, you go to Oregon, you go to Missouri, you meet with the contractor in Pennsylvania or you have him come down here and you get a clear idea of what can be done and what it will cost and you do that before you engage in the design process. Um, and so that, that, would be, that would be our approach, um, would be one to address your SOC um, via getting rid of your I and I through uh, replacing manholes, through manifolding uh, laterals, um, getting the plant biological, and then through a, another, you know, another alternate analysis looking at, okay, these are different ways that we can replace or rehabilitate your, your system. What are those costs? Will those work for a lake floor? Uh, the marine diver, for example, um, when you go to 90 feet, um, they have 30 minutes on the bottom, they have to have a decompression chamber on site. Um, what does that do to the cost of that system? What does that do to the construction of that system? Um, floating a pipe in the water, um, what happens if someone drags an anchor across it? Um, what, what's what's the, the bedrock look like underneath? Could we anchor something like that? Uh, these are all questions that go in that front end planning so that by the time you're in design, you have vetted previous approaches. Um, and then like I say, it, if you know what your subaqueous sewer replacement is going to be, then you design 
your wastewater treatment plant to accommodate it. For example, um, if you went with an HDPE liner uh, that was flushed by lake water and you build an SBR to replace your plant, then you design the SBR to accommodate the, the lake flow by using, uh, by repurposing your existing plant as an EQ basin or by oversizing your batch reactors or by changing up the process within your batch reactors so that when you're flushing the line, you know that you're gonna get diluted water at your wastewater plant. And by putting those things together and by doing a holistic approach, um, you can get to a situation where your infrastructure can continue perpetually into the future. So that, to answer your question, that would be our approach. Now, have you given, just, just curious, uh, converting the, the plant over to biological has been kind of a, a, a goal, uh, spend a terrific amount of money operating a plant that does not break very well. <coughs> on that. We're at a premium for real estate. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, have you given any thought to converting what we have in place to biological? Ab absolutely. Um, that would be one of the first things we would look at. Okay. Um, that's one of the benefits of, of an SBR. Uh, another process is an RBC. Um, and I, I don't really want to bring it up because I don't like those for a couple reasons, but um, that's one of the benefits of an SBR is that you can do very small ones. Um, you can do very large ones. In Dublin, Ireland, there's one that's 45 MGD. Um, so that gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, one of the ways that, um, so one of the things that, that, that's about, that's in the asset management mindset is utilizing your existing infrastructure, maximizing its service life. Um, that is, is something that we've gotten into in, in the past years. Um, I'm a rising board of director in the Buried Asset Management Institute uh, for the next two years. Um, and so looking at your existing facility, evaluating it, trying to incorporate it into a future design. Um, if we can use your existing facility, it costs less money. There's less real estate. Um, but you may not be able to. And, and again, that would, um, you know, one of the first steps in determining what to do with your wastewater plant would be to do a, a condition assessment of your existing plant, looking at the structure, looking at the mechanical equipment, seeing what we could keep, what we could use, and what we could. That's good because we don't have a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anybody else have a question on that? Okay, the second question was uh, securing large revenues. Like I say, we don't have a lot of money. Uh, I think you're probably aware of how much loan we do have from the state, state fund. And uh, you gave, uh, again, a lot of good information on your funding process and the amount that you've given. That, that number was considerably more than we had in the original proposal. And thank you for that um, on that. But uh, do you have any, any ideas or any, any particular approach that you might take to, to acquire funding for, for the projects that uh, you might propose? Yeah, so I, I think it's, it's been our experience um, that if, if there is a viable project that has, you know, that, that obviously is going to benefit the community and that, that there is a need, uh, the funding shows up. Now, I can't tell you exactly where that's going to be, but um, the, the last thing that um, I think the funding agencies want to do and even regulators are to put municipalities in a situation where there's just not a solution. Uh, so, you know, with all the different agencies that are out there, you know, the, the, it, it, the step is, you know, talking to find out who has the funding available uh, and then how do we get that, that, that piece of it. And I think it is going to be a combination of multiple agencies. This is not a single source type of, of grant or loan. And I will tell you, I mean, the state uh, and a lot of the agencies are getting away from grants. It's, it's just a, a, the nature of how the, that, the, those mechanisms are working. Um, so, I mean, that's part of, be part of our job. That's also, you know, as a collective group, you know, all the stakeholders involved. I mean, there, there's, uh, there's a number of calls that can be made to representatives and things like that to help put some of the, the you know, at least get the attention on the project if it's not already there. Uh, to help identify some of those. So <clears throat> I think, um, you know, specifically, the, probably the answer is I don't know yet, but uh, there are multiple, I think there's going to be multiple agencies involved in order to get there. Okay. 
Thank you. Yeah, that, uh, and you have working relationships with all those folks and, and indicated the uh, yes, breakdown of five or six, eight million, or five, seven, five million, I'm sorry, on, on that. Yeah, if you had any experience with, uh, <coughs> you know how to put this, okay. uh, we have a very small customer base that we have more houses along the lake than we have people connected to sewer. Mm -hmm. And of course, all of them use these septic systems for the most part. Uh, we won't discuss the quality of them, just assume they have them. One of the goals that we talked about is how do we, how do we not force, but how do we encourage people to participate in a sewer system that benefits from an environmental standpoint, the lake, I mean, all of us benefit from the lake, so the lake needs to be usable. Um, have you had any experience doing that in, in terms of not just finding grants, but finding additional revenues that are, that are I don't mean forcing the revenues, but that need to be brought in, where do people need to be connected to the sewer? I would say that the the first step um, is really communicating the issue, right? I mean, I think if people understand what is happening, what the issue is, if it does have a, a detrimental effect on the lake, uh, being able to communicate that to them and what the benefit would be to, to be a part of the system. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of effort that needs to go into that communication plan. And we've done those types of, of plans in different municipalities to, to help one, educate everybody on what the issue is and, and what the benefits are of that. Um, and then, you know, to, to, you know, the second point of course, identifying revenues, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult, right? You have, you have X number of users and you have, you know, X number of flow and, and you know, that equates to a, to a, you know, to a number, to a dollar figure. And so, you know, obviously we want to capture as much as we can, you know, so if that's, you know, metering or whatever that is, making sure that's as accurate and as efficient as possible. Um, but without, you know, those two things in conjunction, uh, and so implementing some of the newer technologies have helped identify some of those, that lost revenue, we'll call it, in some of the systems that are out there. So. To, to address, um, to, to highlight one particular um, city that did this, you saw the, the city of Thomasville. Um, it's been um, some years ago, but we did several large annexation areas for them where they were putting in water and sewer infrastructure in previously um, unsewered and, and watered areas. And one of the driving factor were the number of failing uh, septic tanks. Um, and so um, there, you know, as you could imagine, uh, individuals that were having a line run through their yard or run through the back of their property were, uh, were not very happy about it. Um, and and um, I've spent many a, many an afternoon standing on a, on a street corner with an angry property owner explaining to me that they don't need a system and I point down the road and I say, well, you don't, but they do. Um, and so it, it's educating them on the need. Um, and then in some respects, just, you know, the, the, the environment is what um, the focus is. And if you have a septic tank um, that, is, that has failed and is not adequately treating, um, then that either the septic tank has to be uh, repaired or they need to tie in. Um, but it's, um, it, it takes a lot of communication and a lot of community buy-in. Uh, Heather has been uh, with the firm since 2006, and she has been involved with funding uh, probably since 2007 or 8. So. Uh, state agency relationships and coordination. Uh, again, you've outlined some outstanding uh, relationships that you have with them. If, if they came into a ribbon cutting, y'all know it. You know, and I really appreciate that. And, and I don't think, that if, unless there's more elaboration needed on, on that, I, I think uh, we, can, we can go through that one. But, uh, well, and I, I have one question. You mentioned uh, you would consider a partnership uh, joint with uh, Withers Ravenel. Have you done that before? Have you had done that situation before? Uh, we've done partnerships, um, 
Yeah, all, yeah. When it, all the time when it, when it makes sense, you know, from if there's a benefit from you know from the town side, you know, and there's a value to it, then absolutely. I mean, that's um, you know, our goal is to do what's best for you, and if that involves you know another partner or a piece, you know, we're not. The last thing that we want to do is say, you know, we, we're going to do everything. We, we, we've got this. This is not, nothing that, you know, we want at all. This is, that's not what we're, we're about. What we want to do is make sure that if you've got um, a relationship and, if you, and you have expended resources already into a, a group that already has that knowledge, why, why spend that again with us or why go through that again with us if that's already existing? Um, so that was kind of our point of, of doing that. But we have partnered with um, uh, firms before um, specifically with withers I don't know that I I don't know that we've actually specifically partnered with withers on anything uh, before but something you've experienced uh, yes sir absolutely well you have they have a relationship with snobble right I'm doing some business with that existing plus the, the in-house things that they you know, have described to us uh, is, is an outstanding uh, project that's good any I, mean, I actually have one more. So uh, DEQ relationship, you guys went through outstanding. We have a bridge that goes over our dam. That's DOT. My question is, have you worked with DOT? We have. So uh, we have, um, so the way DOT is set up is there's a number of different, what they call codes that you're you know, able to practice engineering underneath. And so um, we are uh, licensed to do work with DOT. Uh, we do work with DOT. Um, our bridge design group is more focused out of our Rochester, New York office where they do a lot of the bridge design work, but we can pull in those resources and the relationships with the North Carolina DOT though are, are local. So we can pull in that, that expertise on the bridge uh, with the relationships that we have already established with the North Carolina DOT. Great, thanks. Okay. I have one question, a new question. If, I mean, you talked about partnerships, so as a general, but uh, if you were selected, how, how do you specifically, what do you think that the town staff and the UAB could do to effectively help your group accomplish a successful project or projects here? I mean, you've got a group of interested people and people who are motivated to have the problem work. So, I mean, how, do you have thoughts on how, are you giving some thought to how specifically they can, how can we effectively help you complete a successful project? I think it's it's um, you know again we're we're one piece of this of this team uh, you know and so uh, the the experience the the history uh, that the UAB also with the council and everybody um, contribute to the success of this project so um, I think ongoing interactions uh, ongoing you know uh, meetings all of that comes together in order to create this positive experience. Um, so specifically, I think you know the the you know uh, with project update meetings or you know however that looks like. I think there's there's this communication piece that needs to happen on a reoccurring basis, right? So that's that keeps everybody involved. It keeps everybody up to date on on the status of things. So when when you're out and somebody asks you you know how is this going or where are we at with this, everybody has the same answer. Everybody knows what's what's occurring, and right. And I think that's important. Um, and again, you know, the role that a professional service organization like ourselves plays is, is to support and add to, um, you know, the, the, the existing team. Like we're a component that you currently don't have those resources available. We can provide those to you. And so we are, we're kind of a plug in to what you already have established. And that's how we view ourselves. We view ourselves as an extension of staff. We'd like to be that, that partner with you guys just, you know, as a, a natural extension of, of what you already have here in Lake Lord. So. I have a question about partnership, Don. Yeah. Go ahead. On a scale of one to ten, and based on everything that you know about Lake Lore and all the issues that you're here to talk to us about, on a scale of one to ten, I mean one being don't have much of an issue to 10 being how would you rate on a scale of 1 to 10 what our issues are that you know about and then as a follow-up to that on a 1 to 10 scale how would you rate your company in being in, on that scale on having the qualifications and the abilities and the passion 
and partnerships to get us to a conclusion and a resolution that will give us a sustainable project. I would say with the information that we know about the current system, um, on a scale of one to ten, I would I would put you guys at probably an eight. Um, I think you know being ten being absolutely critical and and you know and sewers just dumping into a you know untreated into a facility. I know sometimes that's hard to, to hear and understand, but I think that you know from what we understand of the system, uh, there's some significant challenges ahead of us, and that you know we feel on a scale of one to ten that we are absolutely qualified to do this. We do this on a daily basis with lots of municipalities, lots of partners. Uh, we feel like we have the history um, in the state with the relationships that are developed in order to help facilitate this uh, to move forward, to be successful. Um, and I think, you know, in some of the, the uh, in some of the documents, Shannon, you had provided in some of the, um, you know, I think maybe in the RFQ, you, you talk about taking this from uh, a situation that's that's very challenging to a to a, a situation that's you know uh, highlighted and that's promoted and that that's a you know we want to be able to tell this good story, right, of how this all happened, and so that's where I think we also have a specialty in in, in helping to tell that story and working it through the different agencies and the different in, in, the, in the construction piece as well, so that you know looking back <laughs> retrospectively we can all say you know. You remember you were a part of that project and how we turned that around. So. Uh, question I had about partnerships. <clears throat> um, I, I can tell you as a town manager, uh, I've been exceptionally pleased working with SDG engineering with the issues that we faced and it has already helped us in numerous ways and the face of SDG to us is Kurt Wright. Mm -hmm. So kind of give me, give us a feel as to what you think a partnership with SDG would be moving forward, uh, uh, if, if, if any. Sure, so. If the town were to choose you. Right, so, you know, um, you know SDG and Kurt, you know, again, synonymous with, with each other. So, um, you know, uh, I've known Kurt for, 20 years, maybe, um, and so uh, have a great personal relationship with Kurt, also a great working relationship with Kurt, um, and SDG is a very, um, we have a unique relationship in that, you know, Kurt, um, Kurt has relationships with, with towns and cities in, in this part of the, the state, um, and we respect that in, 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 in Kurt, then turns to us to provide the resources necessary to address any issues that any problems that come up that he can't handle personally. So, um, and so what I would envision going forward is that same type of relationship, whether that is um, Kurt as an independent, you know, um, critical eye to, to what's happening, you know, overall to make sure that there's another another set of eyes on this to make you know that, that we're we're headed in the right direction. Uh, or whether he's a part of the team itself and, and providing resource to, to the town. Uh, I think it's very fluid, it's very flexible. Um, I don't know that we've you know, identified anything specific to how that relationship would work, but uh, I think any, anything, that benefits, um, anything that benefits the town would be considered. Does that? I, I think so, I, if I may, just a, a follow up. Uh, we've had uh, firms that we've worked with uh, we have some fairly complex issues, challenges that we're trying to address. Mm -hmm. And so some previous firms that we've worked with, we have uh, we didn't have an engineer on staff helping management, advising council moving forward. Uh, we've worked closely with the UAB. That was really, f I think, formed out of that, that critical need. But we've taken it even a step further and began having conversations and commitments about having an engineer on staff mm -hmm. uh, to help us, not just with sewer. We have a hydro plant, we have a dam, uh, we have dredging, we have a lot of complex issues we're trying to challenge. So as we move forward, a scenario where 
we allow one firm to come in and not have someone on staff watching over is a concern of mine. Mm -hmm. And I'm just being honest Absolutely. and transparent. So um, what would you propose that could be done to help us stay on top of the issues uh, if the town were to choose you? Well, I think and what cost. Sure. So I, I would, um, my take, not knowing a lot of the, the details of, of previous, you know, um, relationships with firms, um, that there, it sounds like there needs to be a period of time uh, to where uh, the town and, and the UAB feel comfortable with the firm that is engaged, right? So there's gonna be an overlap of maybe some oversight that needs to happen in order for everybody to feel comfortable that the recommendations and the interests that we have are actually in the best interest of the, of the town, right? So, um, so it's, I would say that, you know, for the short term duration, that oversight is critical um, from your perspective and from the UAB's perspective in order to make sure that, that we have the best interest of the town in place. We can say it all day long and we can demonstrate other clients that we've done that for, but until you experience it, you're, you're not gonna probably believe us, right? I mean, I get that. It's, it's a, you have, to, you have to experience it. So, so specifically to your question, Shannon, I would say that if you have a, you know, this first year, if there's that oversight, if there's that critical eye watching over, making sure that all the decisions that are being made are, are in fact in line with what is in the best interest of the town, then I could see that that role or that necessity kind of going away once you get to that comfort level with with the firm that you engage. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Shannon. I want to, to to touch base on that. Um, so, um, in, in terms of the role between uh, between the two, between Kurt and SDG and Labella, I'm the liaison between the two firms, um, and what that means is is that Kurt is a partner. But Kurt is also a client, um, and so I want you to understand our relationship. When um, when when Kurt asked me for a proposal to do a particular project, I give him two. Um, I give one to him, and then I give one to the owner. So I answer to two bosses. I answer to the owner, and I answer to Kurt. Um, we have a great relationship. Uh, the the you know, his firm name, SDG, Sola de Gloria, that we have a, a, an, an ethos that is very in common. We have, a, I call it a friendly adversarial relationship where um, I will do something and, and he can take it and he can look at it and he can tell me straight up what he thinks about it. Um, so we already engage in the type of oversight um, that you're referring to. Spindell is a great example of that. Kurt was the engineer of record. So when I demonstrated my design approach, I demonstrated it to Division of Water Resources, I demonstrated it to Division of Water Infrastructure, I demonstrated it to the town of Spindale, but more importantly, I demonstrated it to Kurt because he was the engineer of record on the project. So I had to demonstrate to him what I was proposing. Um, I, I don't foresee that, that um, going forward, um, I already worked for Kurt, and working for Kurt again will not be a change. Um, so he will have the same oversight. Um, we have that relationship where if I propose something and he doesn't like it, he just tells me he doesn't like it. Um, so to, uh, to answer your question, that, that is, that, that's how our relationship currently works, and it would continue to work that way in the future. Um, you would just change hats, so to speak. Um, but I share your concern. Uh, the, I, this happened um, maybe 15 years ago. I went into a very small town. I presented them a design. I literally handed it to the city manager. And I said, here's my design. I'd like you to look over it. And he took it from me. He handed it back to me and said, what do you think? And so I, I say that to highlight your concern. Your concern is legitimate. Um, so here, I, I was being asked to review my own work. Um, and that's not what would take place here. Um, we would do in-house design and then Kurt would act as your representative in reviewing that design, um, having your best interest as his prim primary goal. I just, just wanted, I think you talked about it, but 
you know, I, I don't, you talk about us getting to trust you, I but if you're selected, and I, I mean, I think we start off trusting you enough to prove we couldn't trust you, basically. But, but I, I do think a lot of small towns have, in my background anyway, have fallen into the trap of eventually stopping to watch what's going on just because they got distracted. You know, something. I think one of the reasons they come to UAB was to have a group of people that if you get distracted, so is there any problem if, if, if not because we're suspicious, just because we're curious, we continue to stay involved in whatever projects you're doing for us? Is that something you have resentment? I actually, I actually prefer it. I think we would encourage it. I think again to that point earlier, the more, the more that's involved, the more oversight. The, the, the uh, you know, everybody knows what's happening and why it's happening, right? So it's not necessarily the, the action itself. It's why is this action being taken? And I think that history and those conversations that lead up to that action are, are as critical as the action itself, and that helps. I think the, the oversight of the UAB and, and others. Would, I've got a question too. It's all about uh, your, uh, excuse me, your relationships with divisional uh, water quality or division of environmental quality. Um, does that include all sort of permitting aspects of environmental, depending on the grant that you get? Sometimes you have to do an environmental assessment. You also have divisional water resources. You also have, you also have Army Corps of Engineers. Do you all do all of that internally? Uh, that's correct, yes. And the next question, and we're running short on time, so uh, I think we have done an outstanding job. You can have these questions, so it was incorporated very, very well in, in, your, in your presentation. And the transition from design to construction, what oversight can you provide, and, and what metrics do you stay in on time, on budget, and ensure quality work? And, and I think you've demonstrated that. Well. You've demonstrated the ability to work with people we're already working with, uh, Curd and, and uh, uh, from Standell Brushy Mountain, people who work with those, and, and they, they've done some work for us. So there's some, some outstanding relationships already established on that. So uh, if you want to elaborate any further on that, uh, feel free to, to do so this last project management question. Um, well, just specifically on Brushy Mountain, we currently have uh, Three, two or three projects with, uh, that, that Brushing Mountain is, is doing the construction for our design. Uh, we know uh, all those Jason Perry very well. So Dad Mike, I don't know if you have a chance to meet Dad Mike. Mike's an outstanding person as well. He's worked with those folks for a number of years. Um, but I think, you know, to sum it up, you know, Brian talked through a lot of the, the, the thing, tools that we have in the toolbox to make sure that goes smoothly, but it, it comes down to just having the relationship. <laughs> Good working relationship with, with people, and that's, that's what we focus on. We, we thank you and uh, appreciate the presentation from, from our standpoint. And, and Mary. Yes, thank you so much. We really enjoyed it. Good, very useful information. Thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Best of luck in, in, in everything. And, and so, and please feel free to, to call us with any questions that may come up after this, or even in the future, if, if you decide to go in a different direction, we're always here as a resource to provide any, anything that we can. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Should we take a five minute break now? I think we'll take a five minute break now. Thank you. This is for sure, but those um, recommendation letters are yeah. inside the flag. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Yeah. Oh, you can't. Oh,